Here we are. Here we are. Welcome, everyone, to another Gamifiers meetup. I'm Pete Jenkins. I run Gamification Plus and try and organize these once a month, these meetups. And uh, I'm really pleased today to uh, have as our guest Vasily Gugodis. Almost. Well done. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, How do you say it? Go on, I will get this right one day. Well, well done for the try. Uh, the first name was fine, it's Vasilis. It's Gogidis. Ah, yeah. I, I took the case out and I mispronounced it. Yep. It's that one. <laughs> anyway, everyone, for those who don't know him, Vasily is the author of Designing Games and Gamification for Learning, which is a, a, a pretty practical book, actually on lots of tips on how to design games for serious purposes, particularly learning. He has been active in the gamification community and worked on various gamification projects since 2016. Um, and he is now a PhD candidate and researcher at the University of Southampton. Uh, in his free time, he likes to play as many board games as possible or play on music and release albums. He had, had one out today that hit on your label. Is that right? Yeah. All right, that's cool. And I first got to know him when he was a master's student on my gamification and entrepreneurship modules at the University of Brighton. And uh, I think we must have excited him about the topic of gamification because he proactively came to me and asked to do an internship over the summer, which I wasn't planning to take anyone on, but I was like, okay. And by the end of the three months, he'd proved to be essential. So I had to take him on full time. Just uh, I said it is an essential addition to your team. Although after three years delivering the gamification training and consultancy we were working on at Gamification Plus, he then got that PhD bug about the subject and started doing it full time. He's must, much missed in uh, delivering all our projects for Gamification Plus. Hey, so did I miss anything key in my introduction there? I don't think so. I think you covered uh, most of the essentials that people uh, need to know. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think you covered everything. And maybe we're going to discuss about some of the things that we both forget at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay, so first thing to remember is there is a chat and a Q&A function on, for me on that side of the screen. Uh, and I would like to give away a copy of his book today to the best question or the most upvoted question that people put in the Q&A. Okay, so feel free to add questions in there into the Q&A section, it's the easiest place for us to track it. And then I will keep an eye on that and ask him any burning questions, okay? Reminding everyone it's an e-book, so you're not getting an actual printed book because some people have told me, oh, I thought I was getting a book <laughs> when I gave a free book the other time. Uh, so I'm gonna get a PDF file. <laughs> well, it's a good book. This is why we're having the interview, okay? so. My, my thing is I like to read the book and then ask questions about it. So I'll only do that if it's interesting enough. So that's yeah. good. I mean, I told I told everyone um, how, how you heard about gamification, but what was it that caught your interest about gamification, causing you to get into it? Mm -hmm. yeah, so like you said, um, when I was doing my master's at the University of Brighton, I still remember that day, it was very interesting. Um, so the University of Brighton and a lot of other universities in the UK have a similar approach where you have some electives on semester two when you're doing your master's. And uh, then um, Pete and other teachers at the university were um, in the cafeteria in tables like um, around the room. And you went and asked them, okay, what is your module about? What is going to happen, etc." And I said, gamification, what is this? Sounds fun. Like, am I going to make a game? Uh, and Pete said, yes, absolutely. We're going to make games. And I'm like, yeah, sign me up for it. And um, I actually had to give something else up to take this module, which, um, you know, it was a sacrifice that had to be made. And um, when we started the, the actual module and when you started teaching, Pete, I think what really clicked for me was the, the piano staircase example. I think it's quite famous in the gamification community by now. For those of you that don't know it, you can go on YouTube and just type uh, Piano Stairs and it will come up. Uh, it's a Volkswagen yeah. Fun Theory project. Yeah, in Sweden, right? From memory, I think they tried it in Sweden first. And other, other places adopted it. So it was this um, Piano Staircase where you would step and you would play a note, and then you would step on the other step and you would play another note, so you could... Uh, 
Thank you for the link in the chat, yes. Um, and that made me go, wow, okay, this is uh, really interesting. So the point of gamification is to sort of like improve things and make them more fun and um, improve design. Because I think I haven't studied design directly. I did computer science as my undergraduate, but um, I think subconsciously I was always interested in design. So when I saw gamification, I'm like, okay, wow, this uh, adds a layer of interaction on things that... Um, you know, sometimes uh, might be plain and uh, not super exciting. So I don't know, that idea sort of uh, resonated with me because uh, I like to try and improve things in life, generally. And um, that drove me in. And um, uh, from there, you know, there were other examples that you said with us. And uh, little by little, I said, okay, this sounds really interesting. And I was so interesting interested in it that um, I suggested that we do this internship and um, I don't know if I told you this but um, it was an interesting risk for me as well because I really needed a job at the oh, time yeah. and um, the internship was only three months so if nothing happened at the end of it um, I really needed to find another job which I didn't have to which is great um, yeah I think I answered the question. <laughs> you did, you did. And you mentioned that one of the reasons it, it caught your interest was because you obviously enjoy playing games. So I feel like it's a good time to ask, what games have you played recently? Mm, good question. Uh, I've been going back to my teen years playing Civilization Three with a friend online recently. Civilization Three came out in 2001, mind you. So that's 20 years ago. <laughs> And uh, playing online is a bit of a technical challenge, but you can do it with your friends if you want. You can play Civ 3 online. And we've been revisiting Civilization 3 with uh, this friend of mine. Uh, I play a bit of Mario Kart on my phone every day. So this is my advice. If you have um, to work at home a lot of hours and you're in front of your computer for a long time, and you have to motivate yourself and take small breaks of up, up to five minutes. Mario Kart on your phone is a good game to play because you can do one race and it's like two, three minutes max. And then you go back to working and you had like a pleasant break without necessarily getting away from your desk. Um, so I played some Mario Kart every day to get my dopamine levels up. Um, I play quite a lot of Seven Wonders during... Uh, the pandemic, I've played around 100 games of Seven Wonders, which is one of the best board games out there you can play. Um, so I'm revisiting this with my friends in Greece as well, and it's really, really a good game to play because it has some strategy, but it also has some chance in it. Um, it's not like chess, which uh, I find slightly boring, I have to admit. And the last one I played uh, during Christmas with my family was actually Pandemic. And um, we really enjoyed playing Pandemic, and not just because it's very topical and it's, um, you know, what everyone has been experiencing, but it's also a good game to play with um, a bunch of people that is either your family or friends or, you know, extended family or whatever, because you, you play together as a team against the game. So... Yeah, I would say these are the four games I've played lately. Okay, and what types of what types of games do you enjoy most? Yeah, so I think both like in a digital environment, but also in a face-to-face -face sort of board game setup, I prefer strategic turn-based games um, where we play, you know, our turn, and then something happens, and then we play another turn, blah 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 blah. Um, and I already mentioned some of these games, like Civilization type of games, or Seven Wonders, or, you know, Pandemic is another one. Uh, I like light RPGs, so I play some D&D with my friend, but uh, we don't, let's say, keep all the rules in place. <laughs> we are very flexible. <laughs> we have um, just a few rules in place and it's very simple to play. So you don't need to open books all the time and remind yourself of what you should be doing. That's what I mean by saying light RPGs. I'm not the one to be, you know, 
preparing for hours on end before playing an RPG session. And uh, I really enjoy collaborative games as well, like Pandemic. Pandemic kind of opened my eyes to the possibilities of uh, collaborative games. And um, I've been playing a few since then. And um, I really enjoy it. I think it's a very different dynamic. I, uh, I, do, do you know what? I completely agree. I, I, they've yeah. become my favorite type of board game, is, is having that element of working together with other people, not against them. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like it's a much more positive experience, even if you all lose. Yeah, yeah like in pandemic. Yeah, because you either lost or won together. Um, and that makes you want to play again. Uh, and um, I also like games where they are competitive, but in teams. Like, um, what's it called? Um, it's this game that you, you have to, to guess words. You give a clue, code names. That's what it's code called. Names, yeah. Code names is a really good one because you work in teams to give clues to each other and guess what uh, the word is. So I find it more enjoyable than games where you play on your own. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, <clears throat> so I can see, based on the type of games you enjoy and the work you did for us, that you obviously draw upon these games. So how much do you draw upon the type of games you enjoy in your gamification work and also in the research and how you teach using gamification? That's a, a question I've had to answer a couple of times, actually, since I started working in gamification. And I think, I don't know, I don't know how that sounds, but my opinion is that if you don't play any games, how are you going to design games? And uh, how are you going to find ideas? And how are you going to find feelings, you know? Because like we said before playing Pandemic, I didn't really know how it feels to be in a team working against the game let's say. Um, so now that I know how that feels, you know, it's something that I want to use as well in, in my games. And um, so I always say you need to be playing games to design games or games and gamification. So I, I draw heavily, you know, I have a couple of uh, prototypes that I really need to find some time and progress at some point and get out into the world. So I have a couple of prototypes I made at the University of Sussex with uh, friends and colleagues, and they are copycat games of actual games, but with a serious purpose. So we made a game similar to Pandemic, inspired from Pandemic, and we made a game similar to What Came First. That's what the game is called, I think. Yeah. So what, what were the purposes of these? What's the purpose of your copy? So these were... These were, let's say, pet projects for fun. Uh, the one was we would teach people how research works. Um, so, you know, how in, in pandemic you go around and you try to sort of um, keep the pandemic in, in check, right? In, in our game, you would work as a team to collect data and put the data into like a text and then publish it into the world. Then you would have to go around and play different roles and its role would have a different power, you know. You would have like an administrator at the university. You would have a researcher. You maybe you would have an author or something. Um, and the other one was quite ambitious, I have to say, but uh, the prototype was quite good. I don't know about the audience of that game. So I made it with a couple of friends that um, they are philosophers. So they've studied philosophy. And uh, we wanted to teach people some um, basic ideas of philosophy, and we named it uh, Who Said It First instead of What Came First. So it was very similar in, in terms of, for example, Adam Smith talked about the division of labor, but he wasn't the first one to actually talk about that. Um, there was in the East, I don't remember the country, I think what is now Pakistan or India, a, a philosopher there that talked about division of labor. And mm -hmm. Adam Smith kind of stole the idea from that person which uh, obviously not a lot of people know about, and it's interesting. Um, it sounds like a good challenging game as well. Yeah, that's the thing. We, we were wondering what the audience for that would be. Um, I think some of the questions were quite difficult, uh, but some were quite um, at a good level, in my opinion. So we would need to play test and see, you know, who, can, who could enjoy playing that and not feel like they don't know anything because that's not the goal, obviously. That's very cool. So what are you researching and teaching at the moment? 
So unfortunately at the moment, I'm not engaged in a lot of gamification related research. Uh, I'm working on a project management piece of research with the APM, which is the biggest organization around project management in the UK. And uh, we are doing like this big piece of research um, that it's gonna come out at some point in the next few months. Um, uh, but I am I'm also looking at co-creation of board games as a teaching approach. So that's my PhD project. Uh, how can we improve teaching sessions by an innovative teaching technique such as co-creating board games? So when I say co-creating, means that the teacher creates with the students. Um, so you as a teacher would, would have some input into the game. Yeah. You wouldn't say, oh, go make your own game and then come back to me. You could go and offer them ideas and ask them questions and participate in the whole design process. Um, and what I'm teaching at the moment, I didn't teach anything last semester, which I don't mind because online teaching seems really scary to me. Um, I did some when the pandemic started and um, it was okay. So anyway, this semester that is starting in a few weeks, I'm going to be teaching some project management at the University of Southampton with my supervisor and another PhD student. And actually, we were discussing the other day how we're going to make these sessions more interactive. And uh, we haven't worked the games into it yet. We are still working on the technologies and some other exercises, but um, maybe this, uh, this weekend uh, I'll have some time to try and see what else I can bring to the table. Uh, project management? Yeah. You just need to find a, an online way to play Project Ninjas. Yes, you know what the thing is? We actually bought the game. So last year, in, in the, during the spring semester, um, I convinced the university to buy the game. So they bought a couple of copies of the game. Um, but we never got to use it because the pandemic um, made the university not uh, have any face-to-face -face teaching. So we never got the opportunity to use it. Um, so I since how I've I'll mentioned have... it, um, you do a case study of Project Ninjas in your book, don't you? So you yeah. interviewed um, the creator. Tell us a bit yeah. about the game and why. Why have you chosen to interview yeah, so this one creator, for the book? Yeah, so the creator is Tanya. Tanya, I'm not going to murder your last name if you ever look at this video, but uh, we can have a link to Tanya's profile. Um, Tanya is a learning specialist and she made this project management game, which I found absolutely fascinating. So she came to one of our face-to-face -face meetups in Brighton, and then we played uh, the game in Gamification Europe. And when I played the actual game, I'm like, wow, this is really good to facilitate conversations around project management with students, for example. Because a lot of these uh, sessions can be quite dry, um, even if you have some interactivity with the students. Uh, when you have a session every week for 10, 11, 12 weeks, whatever it is, it does feel like a long time. So breaking things up with a game, you know, after five or six sessions, I thought it was a good idea. So I convinced the university to actually buy around five or 10 games. I don't remember how many we got in the end. But we never got to play them because the pandemic struck. And um, I thought they would be really, really good to play a game, you know, and then spend five or 10 minutes or 15 or whatever time you have discussing, you know, what did we learn from that? How does it apply to real life? Where do we think the game is sort of lacking, you know, some reality, let's say. Um, and the point of that is that the students have different levels of experience, right? Usually in management courses that I've been teaching, some of them will have some real life working experience, some of them won't. So sometimes the ones that have experience, it's useful them sharing their, their experiences with the ones that don't have that experience, right? So we all learn from that and we sort of exchange ideas. So I thought that Project Ninjas was a great way to do that, but... Um, I was unlucky, I guess. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yeah, there's a lot of having to bend with the winds at the moment and to find different ways to deliver stuff. I mean, you talked about how you would have used that in teaching. Um, 
the gamification you, techniques you use in your teaching, can you tell us where this started and how has it progressed since? I think we're getting clues about this and what you've said so far, but what's the journey yeah, sure. like? Yeah, um, so actually the first uh, experiment in uh, higher um, education in the UK, you were part of it because we experimented in your module uh, by gamifying it. And it was an interesting experience, I think. And when I did the interviews with the students, there is an element in that that obviously is different from other modules. So you are teaching a gamification module and we gamified it. So gamifying the module helped the students understand more about gamification, which was really helpful for them. Um, but I thought it was an interesting experience because we didn't get everything right. And we were very open about it. And the students told us. And that was great because it's impossible to get everything right unless, I don't know, perhaps even if you have 30 years of design experience, I don't think you get everything right every time. So I think it was important for us as teachers to also remember that asking the student, what do you think about this? You know, how could we improve it? Is really, really important in the process. And that's where I started thinking about, I need to talk to my students more and I need to ask them more things. And that's where this co-creation idea sort of originated, let's say. And I'm very interested in that. Um, then after that, um, I started delivering some sessions at the University of Brighton. And I had been uh, doing the Lego series play workshops when um, I was working with you. And I said, you know, it works really well with teams and companies. Why would it not work with students? You know, so I kind of adopted some ideas from Lego series play. And then I started using that in the classroom. And it went really well. Um, there were some hiccups, of course, here and there. But uh, I think overall it went really well. And I've been using Lego in all of my classes since then. And students are very happy with it. And I'm very happy with the results as well. Because the important thing is they experience something. You know, it's not like this passive type of learning yeah. where you just oh, back with your head back in the chair, just going, mm, okay, after 15 minutes, I'm tired. And keep talking and then, you know, we'll see what happens. This interactivity and this sort of like being active for the students, I think it helps them learn more. And um, I really, I really kept doing that and it works really, really well. We are both very happy, my students and me. Yeah. And yeah, I was looking to bring board games into the classroom with the Project Ninjas, but uh, because of the pandemic, I haven't experienced um, that yet. Uh, but hopefully soon. I've uh, made games with my students, so we have uh, done some experiments with co-creating games, and that went really well. That was really, really a great experience. Am I right that you've, you've written that up as a piece of research as well? Yeah, yeah. It was published in the European Game-Based Learning Conference. I think I got it right. <laughs> that actually the University of Brighton was organizing in 2020. And uh, that was published there, yeah. We did some experiments. It went really well, and I think uh, the games were quite good uh, for, um, you know, because you need a couple of sessions to improve them, but they were really good. And, yeah, that's where I am at the moment. I'm really looking to get some uh, data from using board games in the classroom. So you've got a bit of waiting to do until we're teaching in classrooms again. Yeah. Hey, look, early on in your book, you talk about the increasing use of games and gamification in, in higher education. How do you feel gamification and education is thought of, particularly by universities? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we've seen a big change in the last five to perhaps 10 years. I think um, a lot of people know what gamification is, first of all, uh, and have... Um, encountered some of the ideas around gamification or serious games or Lego serious play, whatever you want to call it, this playfulness in education. I, I would call it playfulness in education because I think if you get the one idea, it's not difficult to get to the next, you know. If you get Lego serious play, it's not very difficult to get why a board game would work, would work and the other way around, you know. Mm -hmm. At least in my opinion, that's my experience. Because I have introduced these ideas to a lot of people at the university and suddenly we start conversations that lead to, you know, from one thing to another. So I think 
when someone is open-minded at the university um, and when they have the freedom to experiment, which doesn't always happen, uh, sometimes, uh, and I have had this experience with fellow teachers, they go and say to you, um, yeah, we're not happy for you to use Lego because we don't use it and we want all of the seminars to be the same or something like that. Yeah, okay. But, you know, it's disappointing, but um, obviously you cannot do much about it. You have to play by the rules and maybe you can do something smaller in, in your classroom, you know. Maybe you don't facilitate it with Lego 100%, but you do one Lego exercise that is taking like a quarter of your time or something. So I think people that are open-minded uh, are going to give it a go when they listen to the ideas and when they have something specific to use, like a board game or, you know, some Lego or some gamified thingy, I don't know, like an app or whatever. They will give it a go. The ones that don't want to change anything and they don't want to give it to go, <laughs> they won't give it to go. Uh, administration is usually, in my experience at least, keen in most places to try new ways of teaching just in case something improves the ratings. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that's a good reason. That is a good reason. That's a very good reason because it's a very competitive world out there for universities. So my experience has been that administration is keen to even invest a bit of money if they see some value coming out of it, you know. Um, and they know some research might come out of it as well. You know, so your department might spend a bit of money for you to buy board games. If you tell them, yeah, I'm going to write a paper and we're going to teach other people how to use it. So something I found out from my experience in higher education, in the UK at least, I haven't worked in a lot of other countries in higher education, um, is the university wants you to teach other people what you know, right? So we would organize workshops for other teachers to pick up on these ideas. And some of them did, and that was awesome. Honestly, the impact was like, some was so happy when someone told me, yeah, I used Lego in my session and everyone was so happy with it and it went great. That was like really good. So overall, I think people know what gamification is more or less now. Um, and uh, the ones that are going to use it, they will give it a go. The ones that aren't going to use it, they're not going to give it a go and that's the end of it more or less. Cool. We've had a, a tough question for you added to the Q&A, which I'm going to ask you. So now that we are converting to online teaching and learning, any ideas and suggestions how we can implement that gamification at university level, especially for the art and design field? And I think this is a really good question for you because you're quite into the arts in yeah. uh, a lot of what you do as well. Wow, there is four questions in the q and It doesn't show me that, so it doesn't give me a notification. Okay, yeah, so the question is, let me read it again. Convent online teaching and learning, I did, yeah, okay, okay. That's a tough one. That's a tough one because, like I said, I don't have a huge amount of uh, online teaching experience at the moment. I'm going to be doing some more this semester. So the little teaching experience I have online happened when the pandemic struck. So I started teaching face-to-face, -face, and then one week they told us, yeah, in two weeks you're going to teach online. Um, so I didn't have any time to prepare anything, really. You know, I did something really basic, to be honest with you. Now I have more of an opportunity to think about it. Um, art we we art almost art. had an example of this at the conference a few weeks back, actually, which was Sabrina was talking about how to use music. And we didn't have time for it in the session, but one of the ideas was to get the community to come together using some game mechanics to, to facilitate it yeah. and get them to come up with like a, a theme tune for the conference. Yeah. So the whole community would have contributed to it. And I feel like that's a quite a cool way of... Yeah doing some of the teaching and yeah. using some engagement. I'll tell you what uh, also my answer would be. This question doesn't have a name, which is... Um, it's anonymous, because it's... I wanna, yeah, yeah, I want to like address the person directly, because I think it's weird to not address the person directly. Anyway, so I, I think the, the example I mentioned, so if you can co-create some board games with the students, which sounds weird, but I think online you can do it. So. What I use in my workshops, for example, uh, is not anything specific. So I use pieces of papers and pens and, you know, stickers. 
and just random stuff I found on what's called Tiger in the UK. So Tiger is one of these stores that just has like random cheap stuff in it and you go and buy like 20 things and they cost like 10 euros or 10 pounds. And you can make different games with them. So, you know, you can divide them up in teams and tell them to come up with a board game that will teach you something or offer you some experience. So like Pete says, you know, if it's a, let's say, a musical class, maybe it's a game that helps you create some music. You know, it's a game around um, learning history of art, for example. And I think with design, it's, it's quite obvious, you know. If, if the students start making a game, either a board game or a digital game, that's 100% design from the start. And my opinion on a lot of the games and gamification techniques is that perhaps it's easier to use them offline. So that you give it to the students as sort of an assignment or a task you can start in, in the classroom and then they finish it on their own online. Um, because things online take more time. That's my experience. So maybe don't think about it as something that you finish in one session. Maybe it happens over a couple of sessions or maybe they finish it at home, you know, collaborating over Skype or Teams or whatever they use or Zoom. Or whatever yeah, or whatever the university is using, maybe. Yeah, I don't That's know if I, I reply to the question. Or... Let me I know. Think, I, I think so. <laughs> I, I will come back to it if needed. Okay. I, I, there's quite a few questions there now, and yeah. I've got a few more questions that I want to ask to pull out some more stuff from the book, because that's kind of the reason we're here, but I think that'll spark even more questions. Okay. For me, reading the book, there are some elements about how you apply and think about gamification that I think are of interest. So, for instance, you're really keen on highlighting the importance of rules in gamification mm -hmm. design, as opposed to other game mechanics. And I was, I was wondering why that is. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so since day one that I started working in the gamification industry, it felt weird. This uh, very extensive discussion on game mechanics without mentioning other elements of games, such as rules, or aesthetics perhaps, um, felt a little um, weird to me. I'm going to use the same word because I don't have a better one. Um, it felt like something was missing from the whole discussion. And I'll give you an example of how rules can define, govern, and change a game mechanic. And I'm going to use the most classic one used in gamification, leaderboards, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's take a leaderboard. The way we refer to leaderboards in gamification is by, it's a default meaning, right? Everyone competes against one other person. Okay, so we compete against me and you, we compete, and then the other 12 people that are on the call, they also compete with us, and it's 14 of us, and we all compete, blah, blah, blah. Um, we compete against each other. But okay, let's, let's change the rules of that, shall we? Because that's the rule of how you use the leaderboard. Okay, so if you change the rule of the leaderboard, and you say, okay, me and Pete are a team, and then Lina and Ali Reza are another team. You know, or we are, we are a team, all of us. We play this game collaboratively. And we have a leaderboard, and the leaderboard works in such a way where every week, all of us play the same game in one team, and we write down what the result was. You know, and then you have a leaderboard of your team and how it's doing week by week. Okay, so then you compare your own team to your own team the week before. It's still a little bit, isn't it? So you have your best performances as a team, you know, and it's still a little bit. You can perhaps call it a tracking device, <laughs> you know, I'm... tracking your, your progress, but you know what I mean? I think a lot of the discussion around game mechanics assumes what the rules are. And I, think, I think that's a really good point. So you're saying like there's this assumptive design element, which is the rules. And actually, yeah. maybe if we were more specific about that, we could do better game design overall and yeah. do more interesting things. And I think when you conceptualize, when you think about a game conceptually, right? And the examples I use in my book are football or soccer. 
if you're not from Europe, um, and uh, Monopoly. Because they're well spread, they're, they're the games that you know a lot of people will know about. And the example I give with football, for example, is this very simple conceptualization. When you have you have a goalkeeper, right? And the rules say that it's the only person that can touch the ball. What if you take that away? And no one can touch the ball. You know, what if uh, the win state, which the win state is a specific rule for me, it's a special rule, in my opinion. How does a game end is the win state, right? How if the win state in football was who, who would foul most? You know, the team that does the most fouls, they are with the winners. <laughs> it would be more like a game of MMA or box <laughs> rather than football. I'm not sure but I want to play in that game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's what I mean. We think of rules as set in stone, and they're not. They are human-made. And we can change them at any time. And the game will change profoundly. Now, see, that's an interesting point. Because also in the game, you talk about um, once a game is running, you should carefully observe the impact that the rules have on the players and then adjust them if needed. Yeah. which is kind of what you're saying there. And I'm thinking, what does that look like in practice? And how do the players feel about the rules being changed? Yeah. And I'll, before I answer the question, I'll give you an example. I can send you this book. I don't remember it now, but again, about football. I'm not a football fan necessarily, but it was an interesting book. Uh, my dad gave it to me. And it sort of tracked the history of football. And he, football at the beginning looked more like rugby than football. And the rules changed over time. So the, the sport, the game changed a lot over time because the rules changed, right? To answer the second part of the question is um, play testing. So the, the safest way, in my opinion, to, to change the rules and see how they impact your players is by, by testing your game, right? So you have a prototype. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be just pieces of paper with some writing on it. And... Um, then you either play it on your own with your team or friends or family or whatever, or you give it to some potential players. My personal, you know, um, choice is to play it with people I know well first and then to give it to people I don't know personally uh, because the feedback can be quite harsh, actually. <laughs> um, so when you play this, you can uh, step outside the game and observe, you know, and self-reflect as well because you are a player and when you play, you go, mm, actually, this is a lot of fun and this is not interesting or the turn takes a long time to finish or, you know, I, I give a certain advantage to this type of player, for example, in my game. Um, and then based on these feelings and observations, you make these changes and you play again and you play again, almost like an experiment where you sort of um, try to see what the impact of uh, one specific variable is on what you're studying. I think there's a key extra thing that's happening there as well, which is because you're play testing with the players, when you change a rule and they like it, they are more likely to adopt it as well. I'm just yeah, thinking, I'm thinking like um, in Monopoly, one of the rules is you keep going until there's only one player left. Right. But actually, most people don't play that way. They've all agreed that at a certain point, you just add it, add up the results and say we've yeah, stopped there. It, it, yeah, it, and everyone's happier because of that, apart from the person winning, probably who wants to go on to the bitter end. But <laughs> the majority are happier. Yeah, Monopoly is quite a silly game in my opinion. <laughs> It's good for illuminating these sort of points. So, <laughs> hey, um, I'm conscious of the time, and I've got quite a few questions to get through. So, you have a really nice section on game mechanics in the book, from timers and randomness to meaningful choices and empathy, and then you've pulled out story and narrative separately to become a whole section on its own. So that's obviously really important to you, and in fact, you've created the inverted storytelling pyramid as a way to help you enrich learning games. So why is narrative so important to you? And can you tell us a bit about the framework? Yeah, I think narrative uh, is important because you don't need to have a lot of it, but uh, you always have some of it, even if you don't know, I think. Sub not subconsciously, like inadvertently, you would have some narrative to your game. It cannot be a blank 
game. Even if you think you don't have a narrative, you always have a narrative. Even the aesthetics of the game, how it looks, what you do in the game has a narrative. Like Project Ninjas, for example, doesn't have a story, but it has a narrative. You are project managers and you work in a team and you are, the board looks like an organization, like offices, and you go around, you are a different role. So it has a theme and a narrative, but not a story. And that's the point I'm making with this framework, the inverted storytelling pyramid, I call it. So the bottom layer, which is sort of the smallest, that's why it's like an inverted pyramid, it's a small bottom layer, it's the theme which doesn't need to have story actually, or it can have very minimum story, something pretty small. And the example I give is Super Mario. Super Mario is a game that doesn't really have any story in it. You are this plumber and you try to save the princess and the princess is abducted by Bowser and that's it really. Which, you know, it's not a complicated, it's more of a theme than a story actually. And then you go up to the story. You have specific characters and specific timelines. This would be games like Skyrim, for example, mm -hmm. where you have specific things happening and you're part of the story and you make choices and change the story, etc. And then you have world building, which, in my opinion, world building is the most complex one. And um, I also talked uh, in uh, the presentation at the Gamification Europe Conference a little bit about making a universe and using historical places, places that existed in human history. So I'll give the example of Lord of the Rings, which is a, you know, a made universe, it's not a real universe. And um, um, what's it called, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is based in ancient Greece. You know, it happens in ancient Greece. And I mean, most people in the world have some concept of what ancient Greece looked like, more or less. So you are pulling these elements from history. So your world building is more like re research rather than mm -hmm. coming up with things. You know, like um, I mentioned uh, in the presentation as well that where this framework came about, it was from a video on YouTube. My YouTube addiction of watching stuff on YouTube paid off. And um, there is this great video, I'll send you the link, around the world building and it gives examples of Tolkien in Lord of the Rings and uh, Frank Herbert in Dune, where they built these amazing universes. You know, Star Wars is another good one, which is not a book, um, but it's a really good universe that Lucas created, pulling from a lot of other different material. So, so, on with so, so if, we, if we've got this right, you've got narrative happens whatever, so we need to put it in the design. Yeah. Because if we haven't put it in the design, we'll, the narrative could easily go wrong. So we need to think about it. So that's yeah. the first big learning from this. I see that. And then you can build upon that with the story elements. Yeah. And then the top bit, the world is also, so you could also call it the story behind the story, I guess. Yeah, I think, so first of all, I call the first level theme on purpose because I don't want to call it narrative because it's quite close to story. And I don't want to have this conversation. Oh, it's narrative story or is story narrative? Okay. And all that. Um, so I call it theme just um, to get around these conversations. Uh, world building, like you said, is what moves around when the author or the game designer doesn't move it. So these different parts you give to the player and you don't need to move them all the time. Like examples, economy, you know, how, how does the economy of a place work? For example, they raise horses and they sell them to the kingdom next to them, you know. Uh, they, they are an agricultural society and they sell their produce to the islands. And the islands are a touristic society or something, or a fisherman, you know. So you explain how the economy works and you don't need to explain it again. This moves in the player's head without you mentioning it again. Um, or for example, the background of a character. When you give some background at the beginning of a game and then you use it to build up the game and the story, you don't need to build it again. But the world building is larger themes, religion, economy, um, geography. Geography is a big one when you make a universe especially. And again, 
you know, when you take Assassin's Odyssey as an example, in a way they had a they had keys with geography because you pull up a map of Greece and there you have it, you know. Um, whereas uh, if you make your own universe, that is more difficult to do. You need to create everything from scratch. Um, and the final sort of a, a practical point, like you said, is when I design a game, I can reflect using the framework. What is the theme? Do I need the story? Because I don't always need the story. Do I need world building? Because I don't always need world building. Maybe I just need the theme and that's all. But I should be conscious as a designer of what my theme is. I should reflect on it and say, mm, actually, maybe we need some changes or mm, that's great. It works. You know. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's a nice set of questions to ask as well as just a framework. So, you've, yeah, that actually answers my next question, which is, can you give us a practical way to use it? And you've just answered that. So that's <laughs> great. I mean, the rest of your chapter on story and narrative, you obviously you cover the hero's journey, which I don't want to go into now. I think everyone knows that. But you also go into the collective journey based on the work of Jeff Gomez. And you've got a superb interview with Jeff in the book. Yeah. What, what highlights can you draw out from that for us here now? And why have you added that in to this? Yeah. Um, first of all, it's a superb interview because Jeff is superb. And thank you, Jeff, if you're watching this at the later time. Um, so what I really, really enjoyed from this interview, and I think the main learning from it is that the collective journey, in contrast to the heroes or heroines journey, I call it, is that we're not talking about a leading character or two. We're talking about a community of characters. And these narratives are about communities of people trying to understand how to exist in broken systems. And heroes and characters that are flawed compared to heroes we had in the past, like Superman is a good example of someone who is like perfect in every way. Um, so these characters are all flawed and they are more like their audience rather than this lofty, you know, ideal that we might have about uh, a transhuman, let's say, or someone who has superpowers. Examples of that, if you want to check them out, are Walking Dead is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. And I would personally suggest the comic book, not the TV series, is my personal preference. Um, uh, Orange is the New Black on Netflix is a really good TV show. Orange is the New Black also covers something that Jeff mentions in the interview as well. It covers diversity. It covers diversity of community. So Orange is the New Black has a diversity in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, which is what most societies are made up of. We are not all Bruce Wayne's being multi-billionaires and having expensive gadgets. You know, these are characters that people can relate to easily um, compared to other characters in the past that, you know, I'm not saying stop superhero stuff, but um, I think it's really interesting that these narratives are so successful. The ones that involve community and sort of everyday people, just simple people that, um, have flaws and just try to make it into a very difficult to navigate universe and world, which um, I think wow. is all of us. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, I don't know if you call this out directly in the book, but I think it's a really good parallel for using this type of narrative or story in learning, because it should include everyone. You're not generally teaching one-to-one. -one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's something, again, to reflect on. You know, how much do you listen to your students? How much do you listen to their stories? Um, how much do you ask them about their stories? You know, I think a lot of learning can happen during these conversations, actually. That's very cool. Right, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna go to the Q&A from the audience, because there's loads of questions. Um, I mean, one of the things you're gonna have to answer is which one is your best question to give an award to, to give the book, a copy of the free ebook to. Albert's question is proving very popular. Yeah. So, so I think we should ask it. Okay. <laughs> how, 
How yeah. do you go about bringing a complex real world concept into a game, which tends to be a simplified version and still get the appropriate learning across to the player, the user, the student, whoever they are? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so it, it is a great question and um, <laughs> it's not easy to answer. I think, I don't know if you, if you watched um, this conversation from the beginning, Albert, but I mentioned one prototype that I made with two friends that um, they are philosophers and uh, we try to, to explain some philosophical ideas with this game um, just by saying who said it first and uh, by simplifying the, the theories in one or two sentences. I think that the challenge with that is are you oversimplifying something that is very complex and who is your audience? Right. So with that game, for example, the philosophy game, perhaps there is a, a level where you cannot simplify it further than that. Okay. So I can explain the basic idea behind the theory to a lot of people, or perhaps not to every single person. So perhaps the audience for such a game would be, you know, first year undergraduate philosophy students. Or first, or you know, high school students that um, get taught some philosophy, and you want to engage in a fun way with some of the ideas, or some just everyday people that don't study philosophy. I don't, I don't know who would be because we didn't get to the point of play testing it with different groups. We just play tested among ourselves. And uh, <laughs> just to answer your question, I, that I'm not a philosophy student, had to say to them. Some of these questions, I have no idea what's going on. You have to like bring it down a little bit. So I think a big one is what is your audience, right? To make something complex into a simplified version, you need to reflect on what the audience is. What the time you have, how much time do you have? You know, how much time does a game take to play, for example? If you have a board game that is complex and it takes an hour to play and you have 45 minutes, then it's not going to work, is it? Um, but for example, the game we were trying to make was really quick and you could play a couple of turns and then just stop. Um, so you have to reflect a lot. When it comes to learning, you have to reflect a lot on your context. Are you teaching a um, company to do something? And do you have one hour, three, or a whole day with them? Are you teaching students? Are they undergraduate? Are they postgraduate? What do they know about the subject? Is it the first time they've been taught of this subject or is it the second time perhaps? You know, it happens that there is overlap sometimes. I think especially like in management courses, if you do an undergrad and a postgrad, same things will come up time after time. So yeah, I, I hope I answered your question, but I think it's a lot about reflecting what is your context and... Um, I feel like I'm going to add to this one because yeah. I had uh, a client that had a really interesting complex need like this, which was about sustainability in the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is like, I've forgotten how many, 17 different goals. And some of them don't interact very well together. You can solve one, but cause an issue over, over somewhere else. And we were trying to create a gamified way of getting people to understand this. I think it's really complex. And the thing that suddenly occurred to us was people are complex. So the essence of the game we built was around giving every person different roles to play based on the SDGs or the complexity. So I would be playing the role of one of those elements and how we interact with each other has consequences, but we're all still in it for our bit. And it was a really interesting way of getting loads of complexity in, but keeping the game actually quite simple. And I feel like there might be ways to do that with other complex concepts that don't necessarily relate to a person. But if you can find a way to do that, that might work. Yeah. But I'm stealing your show here. So. Oh, that's fine. How much time right. do you have? I have no idea. We, well, we've got five minutes left exactly, but that includes chatting time afterwards. Wow. So I'm going to let you answer one more question. <laughs> The next most popular question was Lena's, which is, do you have a real life example of great gamification in learning? And I think this would be a great question to, to finish up on. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, do I, we mentioned a few already. Um, so 
I would refer to the book because the book does have some really good examples of gamification in learning. And, um, and we mentioned one, we mentioned uh, the Project Ninjas case study. Mm -hmm. uh, the other game I have is a game uh, for um, elementary school students. Lost it's, My Mummy, that one? Yeah, to teach them It's great because uh, we've played that one, haven't we? Yeah, to teach them about ancient Egypt. And then the third one was a project in Nokia in Athens. It was a gamified learning about 5G experience. Uh, and the other one was something I created in my hometown Thessaloniki. It was a treasure hunt for locals and refugees to get to know each other. And um, I think all of these examples that are in the book are really, really interesting and in different settings and different sort of uh, case studies. Other famous case studies are obviously Minecraft for Education. You know, that's, a, that's one that a lot of schools used even before the pandemic. And um, a lot of, um, I don't have a lot of specific ones right now. I can perhaps share some links later. I liked your answers then because what's nice about your case studies they, is you're right. They all tick different elements of learning. The Project Ninjas is obviously quite advanced project management in person. Lost My Mummy is aimed at much younger kids ready for tomorrow yeah. as an example in the world of learning in the corporate world i i really like your your um the the one built using action bound for the refugees and getting those to work with local people like a community understanding and learning yeah. about each other game they're, they're all good in different points and i think that's the issue is when you ask the question do you have a great gamification and learning example you kind of need to know what the objective was and what the setting is to choose the right one Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that depends on the context a lot. Even very quickly, the, for example, the Nokia example um, lasted for like three to six months, you know, because they would go to work every day. And it was gamification and it would happen every day. But uh, the Lost My Mommy game or the Project Ninjas game lasts for 20 to 40 minutes, for example. Because they are a different context, because in education, in a school or at the university, you have a specific time to, to do something. So you need to do that in that specific time. And it's very different. Super. Thank you so much, Vasilis. Hey, look, how best can our viewers get in touch with you? Yes, find me on LinkedIn. Um, you, you can see my name there on my window, Vasilis Gorgidis. Find me on LinkedIn. And add me on LinkedIn. Let's have a chat. Send me a message if you are interested in the book, and I can tell you all about it. Uh, the person, Albert, with most votes, won the book. Well done, Albert. Send me a text, and I'll send you the book. Um, yeah, and let's have more chats. I mean, we're out of time, but I'm very happy to have more chats about and answer the questions because uh, they're great questions. Um, all right. Super. Thank you very much, for this for coming along, being part of this interview, being so open and informative with your answers. And you. uh, we look forward to seeing everyone at the next Gamifiers meetup. Thank you very much. Bye.